Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight as we study the book of Revelation. We've been exploring this book of Revelation uh, for this quarter, and we are looking at it not only on Sunday mornings during our live stream classes, but also on Wednesday evening as we post these uh, videos or PowerPoint voiceovers as we continue our study on the book of Revelation. And because of that, uh, it, over the course of 13 weeks, we'll have approximately 25 lessons uh, because we usually have a singing at the end of the quarter to, uh, for the final Wednesday, but we'll, we'll see how that goes here as we uh, think about this since we've rearranged so many of our uh, procedures in this uh, COVID crisis of the pandemic. But nevertheless, 25 or 26 lessons allows us uh, just barely over uh, time to focus on one chapter per lesson. And so we're looking at this as sort of an overview of the book of Revelation. And I know that uh, there are many in our congregation that are very uh, serious and careful students of the book that would like to explore many different things on a, a more detailed level. Uh, and th that's certainly something that uh, I welcome you to pursue. But as we think about our objectives to looking at a, an overview of the book and to get a uh, kind of an idea of its main contents and its main message that we can take with, uh, we're not going to have an opportunity to go into an extreme detail of every explanation of every possible nuance of all the different images and visions that John had. And so that's something that uh, you certainly might want to pursue. I have been suggesting several scholarly commentaries and books throughout our study. And you can go back and look over some of the previous classes and slides where I've mentioned some of the more uh, helpful studies that I've uh, had the opportunity to read and to examine. And I'll do some of that a little bit later, especially as we get toward the end of of the book. For now, it's important to realize that John is using several series of seven. There were seven churches of Asia with seven lampstands. Here we have seven seals on a scroll that only the lamb was worthy to open. And after the sixth seal was opened, there was an interlude, a pause before the seventh seal was opened. And in that interlude, we were focusing in chapter seven on the great multitude or the 144,000. I mean, the message is uh, who can endure the wrath of the lamb? And then chapter seven gives us the answer. God's people can endure. They have nothing to fear from God and his judgments, but the earth dwellers and those who are evil and uh, sinful and going against the precepts of God, they have everything to uh, fear when it comes to the judgments of God. And so between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, there was a pause or an interlude that described the identification of God's people. Keep in mind that apocalyptic literature is designed to focus on a binary identification of good and evil and the people of God and the people of Satan or the people of evil. And so the, the two main classifications of people in the book of Revelation are the earth dwellers and those that follow the beast and God's people, those who have been marked by God, who have been uh, receiving the seal of God on their foreheads. They are the people of God. They are part of the 144,000, the great multitude. And so after the seventh seal was opened, we discovered as we were reading in chapter eight and nine, that this was a series of uh, trumpets that were sounding by the angels that were given the trumpets. And as they sounded the trumpets, different series of judgments came upon the earth dwellers but they were not allowed to harm the people of God or the people that had the seal of God on their foreheads. No, they were to be spared. They were to be taken care of. 
And so that's why there was that interlude between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, so that we can discover and enumerate and identify who the people of God are. And as we come now toward the end of the series of trumpets, we have uh, several trumpets that have been sounding, and then there's going to be, as we see, a interlude again between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. So let's that puts the context in what we're looking at right here. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. And his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion when he called out the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and don't write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, and the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there should be no more delay. But in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God, as he announced to his servants the prophets, should be fulfilled. What I'd like to emphasize here as we uh, look at the uh, verse 6 of this chapter is that there's going to be no more delay. The, that there should be no more delay, but that the trumpet call that would be sounded by the seventh angel would fulfill the mystery of God. Now keep in mind that in chapter 6 and verse 10, when the fifth seal was opened, there were the souls of the martyrs under the altar who were ex expressing in their prayers to God, how long, sovereign Lord, until you avenge the blood that we have shed? And the answer at that time was, uh, you have to delay just a little longer until the number of your fellow servants should be fulfilled, who were to be killed just as you were killed. And so God has been focusing on the fact that his people will be persecuted. And in the first century, in the persecutions in the context of the Roman Empire and emperor worship, they were going to be persecuted. And some of them would pay the ultimate price with their lives. But they were told to wait. They were told to be patient. They were told to delay just a little longer before this would be fulfilled. And then now, here we are in chapter 10, and the seventh trumpet is about to be sounded by the seventh angel, and the message comes back, there's going to be no more delay. Now the punishment that's going to come upon the earth dwellers will come fully down upon them. And God's people, of course, will be vindicated because of the suffering that they had endured. As we continue reading in chapter 10, it tells us that the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat. I will, it will be bitter to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. And so I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. As we've been noticing in this apocalyptic language that John uses, is that he uses the Old Testament language of the prophets uh, to a significant degree. 
Here you have a comparison bet between what Ezekiel was told in chapter 2, and I'll read a few verses from that in just a moment, and what John is told here in verse 10. He takes this little scroll and the angel uh, from out of the hand of the angel, and he ate it, and it was sweet as honey, John says, in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Uh, let's notice from Ezekiel chapter 2 some of the similarities in this language. So in Ezekiel chapter 2, uh, beginning in, in verse 8, it says, But you, son of man, hear what I say unto you. Don't be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I will give you. And I looked, and behold, a hand was sent to me, and it was a scroll er therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written, written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. Continuing our reading in verse 1 of chapter 3. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the roll, or the scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, cause your belly to eat, and fill your bowels with this roll that I give you. And I ate it, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And he said to me, Son of man, go and get this into the house of Israel, and speak my words unto them. And so just as Ezekiel was told in the days of the preceding the Babylonian captivity that uh, he needed to go and teach the word of God unto his people, the people of God, the people that he was associated with on the banks of the river Kibar, a tributary of the mighty Euphrates. He was told to go and preach unto the people and the message that he was going to give them had to be thoroughly digested by himself personally. So basically, you know, you think about someone who is preaching a message of any kind, in order for that communication to be effective, the person who's doing the communication must be thoroughly imbibed in that message. It's like uh, uh, Paul was telling Timothy to, to give yourself entirely to the Word of God to uh, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the idea is to take into yourself and your heart and mind the word of God and preach that message to the people that I send you to. In the case of Ezekiel, it was his fellow captives on the banks of the Kibar river. In the case of John the Apostle, it's to the seven churches of Asia and giving that message in an extremely visual imagery full of pictures and uh, tremendous visions. Well, this brings us uh, to chapter 11 and uh, we're going to continue our study this evening in chapter 11 and uh, I anticipate that we'll pretty much finish this chapter but we'll begin with this chapter just kind of to review the salient points that we've examined and anything that we uh, have left out we'll look at even further on Sunday morning as we continue our study looking at uh, this chapter. In chapter 11, <clears throat> the text continues. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant my two witnesses power to prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. And so here we have a very remarkable image that uh, John is given to measure the temple. And uh, as I mentioned last week, that uh, 
There are many expositors, scholars, and commenta commentators and preachers who consider chapter 11 to be one of the more difficult chapters in the entire apocalypse. And while that opinion may very well be true, uh, I'm going to uh, mention a few things this evening that uh, at least give my perspective that I don't think it's an, uh, entirely difficult as some people might suggest, but that uh, it falls in line with the same kind of thing that we've been looking at before with the opening up of the seven seals. Remember that between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, there was an interlude, and the interlude was to mark the people of God, to identify who was going to be able to endure the wrath that would be coming, and who was going to be spared from any of the troubles that would come from God's judgment. That would be God's people. And so now we're going into the visions, the series of the trumpets sounding, and there are six trumpets that have sounded and now we have a pause or an interlude before the seventh trumpet sounds and the message is essentially the same before the seventh trumpet sounds god's people must be identified they need to be focused on who's going to be able to endure who's going to stand who's going to be spared it's god's people and so this whole image, this whole figure, this whole picture of measuring the temple, in my opinion, is simply a way to identify God's people. It's not to be understood in a literal fashion. It's not literally the temple of Jerusalem in uh, the city of Jerusalem. It's talking about God's people. And uh, we'll look at some reasons why that is the case. I've already given you the contextual structure of the book as to why Revelation itself would have that idea because it's the interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. Just like in chapter six, there was a sixth seal opened and then chapter seven, there was an interlude or a pause before the seventh seal was opened. So as, uh, as we look at chapter 11 and the temple that is being described there, of course, the, one of the first things we have to focus our attention on is to keep in mind that this is a book of symbols. It's a book of signs. It's a book of figures and pictures. And so what we have here, just like Ezekiel had in his vision of chapters 40 through 48, this vision of a temple, it wasn't any literal temple like Solomon's temple or Herod's temple that came later. It was simply a picture that was going to help God's people realize that they would be able to endure the Babylonian captivity and would one day eventually get to go home. And when they did go home, they rebuilt a temple. Uh, but it wasn't going to be according to the sp specific dimensions that Ezekiel describes in chapters 40 through 48. And similarly here in the Apocalypse, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11 talks about the measuring of the temple. Keep in mind that there are several passages in the New Testament that focus on Christians being described as a temple. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, the, the, Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he says, don't you know that you are the temple of God? And so he's speaking to them about uh, taking care of that temple and to make sure that they are uh, holy with their bodies because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and also you yourselves are God's temple. And he reiterates this idea in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and move among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so uh, this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16 clearly uh, identifies the people of God as being uh, God's temple. 
A similar passage is found in the epistle of 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'd like to read verse 5 that uh, focuses on this same idea. He says, and you're like living stones or bricks, uh, yourselves built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so uh, another passage that I think uh, kind of uh, teaches the same point is the imagery that is found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and uh, we'll look at verse 21. Keep in mind that verse 20 talks about the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then in verse 21 it says, In whom the whole structure is joined together, and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And so the imagery of God's people being described as a temple is consistently portrayed throughout the New Testament. And that's what I think the imagery is referring to here in chapter 11. The temple refers to Christians those who are being persecuted in the first century. These are the very individuals to whom the apocalypse was written. Keep in mind that the Christians who had already given up their lives, who were dead and had committed their lives unto God, they were the ones that were the souls under the altar, that were crying up to God, how long, Sovereign Lord, before you avenge us? And then in... Uh, the message is that it's not going to be very long, but there are going to be some of your fellow Christians that need to uh, die as well as you. And that's to whom this apocalypse was written. <clears throat> On Sunday morning, we looked at some clues in the text of Revelation that seemed to point to the identification of God's people in certain passages of the book. That is, the Christians that were the ones that John was addressing the book to in the first century were the ones that he was trying to encourage and to persuade to remain faithful in the midst of persecution and the trial and the tribulation that they would endure, uh, this ordeal that they were to uh, endure, was the method by which they would be ultimately victorious. When we look at the book, there are several clues that point to uh, who in fact these people are, and we looked at uh, most of these uh, on Sunday morning. I'll just remind, uh, remind us of a few of these from one of the slides, beginning in, in chapter 9. There are the locusts that were to harm humans uh, that don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. Why? Well, because the people of God have the seal on their foreheads and they were not to be harmed. The, the harm and the issue that would come upon the, the earth dwellers would not affect the, uh, the people of God. They were protected. God protected them with his seal. Just like in the book of Exodus, when God sent the plagues against the Egyptians, the tenth plague affected the firstborn child of the Egyptian families, but it did not affect the Hebrew families because they had taken precautions and they had made the identification of their, um, with the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lentil, where the angel of death would pass over them and not affect them. And so here you have the... Uh, fifth trumpet coming upon the people, and then the sixth trumpet, and then finally the seventh trumpet. The fifth trumpet is uh, to, to harm some of the people, but not to kill them, only to harm them. And then the sixth trumpet, which is equivalent to the second woe, that was told to kill one-third of mankind on the earth, uh, but not all of them. And they would be harmed, but not God's people. They have the seal of God on their foreheads, and they would not be harmed at all. And then in chapter 9 and verse 20, the rest of mankind that did not repent of their evil, they were going to be punished as well. 
And yet this would exclude Christians because they were the ones that God had sealed. If we continue with chapter, seven, uh, chapter 10 and 11, you have the same idea that the Christians are identified. And I have uh, used uh, red font type and uppercase letters to indicate the way I read the text that uh, is referring to Christians. And so in chapter 11 and verse 4, if anyone would harm them, that refers to the two witnesses, also equivalent to the two olive trees, which is also equi equivalent to the two lamps or the two lampstands, uh, if anyone were to harm them. And so uh, let's look at that text uh, in its context. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If any one would harm them, thus he is doomed to be killed. So the them refers to Christians, and the warning is, don't you dare try to harm my Christians, my people. They are not to be harmed at all. If you continue reading in the text in verse 6, it says, they have power to shut the sky that no rain may fall upon during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. These are the two witnesses, of course. And they have uh, to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, that's these uh, two witnesses, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit will make war upon them. Who is the them? Well, the them refers to the Christians. The two witnesses refers to the Christians. They are several images to refer to the same group of people. And they will conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is allegorically called Sodom and, and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three days and a half, Men from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those that dwell on the earth, these are the unbelievers, these are the godless, ungodly, non-Christians, as opposed to the ones who are the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two lampstands, which are God's people. It says here that uh, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Those that dwell on the earth are the non-Christians. The two prophets, the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two lampstands are Christians. Think about Jesus saying, where two are gathered in my name, there I will be also. Think about what the scriptures in both the Old Testament and the New Testament say about the power of two witnesses, that one witness is not sufficient in a capital offense, but there needs to be two witnesses to agree as to the event that they are witnessing or testifying to. And the same thing is true with uh, the testimony of Christians before the world. Together, uh, they're able to make a strong case for following God and his people. Verse 11 again, notice in chapter 11, says after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And in the sight of their foes, they went up to heaven in a cloud. This is a marvelous promise and image that would have struck fear in the hearts of those who had seen it, who were the earth dwellers, but would have been a rejoicing opportunity and occasion for those who had been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Those who were God-fearing Christians 
uh, who had been killed, the, the Christians here that had been martyred because of their faith, were now resuscitated. Their bodies were filled with life again and coming up to heaven. And God says, you come up here. And then verse 13 continues, at that hour there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Verse 14 says that behold, the second woe has passed. The third woe is soon to come. So as we explore this structure of the book of Revelation, we see a series of seven seals and an interlude between the sixth and the seventh seal. And then when the seventh seal is opened, what that amounts to is a whole new series of seven, the seven trumpets. And we have six trumpets that are sounded, and between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, there is another pause. There is another interlude. And in that interlude, God's people are identified. In chapter 7, between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, they were sealed with a, a seal of God on their foreheads. And in chapter 11, between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, they are measured as a temple of God. And so in both of those cases, God's people are identified and they are going to be spared any of God's judgment against the earth dwellers that would be suffered by, at least in some cases, they would be harmed but not killed. And then later on in the sixth trumpet, there would be killed one third of them. And then between that, the, the rest of mankind were supposed to repent and yet they did not repent. And so then there's going to be the seventh trumpet that will ultimately sound. Now, in our class on Sunday morning, when we come back together, we're going to be exploring the second half here of chapter 11 and start chapter 12, but we'll be exploring this structure of the book again, focusing on the series of seven seals and then the seven trumpets and the seven thunders and the beginning of a new series of seven, which would be seven bowls of wrath, which really give us the material that we'll be looking at in the second half of the book of Revelation uh, after chapter 12 and following that focuses on the outpouring of the seven bowls of wrath. So this is a marvelous vision that John has and he's sharing with the Christians of the seven churches of Asia and also with us, Christians of a different time and place, and yet the message is timeless and true for our benefit as well, that whatever trials, tribulations, ordeals, sufferings, or persecutions that we might have to face, we must be faithful Christians unto God and realize that he will protect us, preserve us, keep us a home in heaven. As he says to these people, come up here, up to heaven, we can rejoice in that same wonderful blessing and promise. Thank you for joining us tonight as we continue our study of the book of Revelation. We will pursue our study uh, this Sunday morning once again in our live stream class. And some of you are welcome to join us uh, in a distance if you're unable to be with us at Citrus Park. God bless you.